Dear friends, the end is coming. That's what Jesus told his disciples, and it was true for them, and it is true for us. Our readings today from Micah and from the Gospel seem full of contemporary allusions, wars and the rumours of wars, Jerusalem surrounded by armies, and so on. It's important not to be distracted by the idea that Jesus is predicting particular events in our time. That's a 19th century heresy that has sadly become influential in some North American Christian cultures. Jesus is talking about his own time specifically, and yet he is also talking about all possible times everywhere. I think I might need to unpack that. Jesus, elsewhere in the Gospels, criticises people for being able to read the patterns in the weather, but not being able to read the signs of the times. This is what he's doing here. He's pointing out that in the context of the might of Rome, those that choose a path of armed resistance to that empire, those who are following the footsteps of the Maccabeans, they were bringing a certain fate upon Israel. Within the lifetime of those to whom Jesus was speaking, there was an armed revolt against Rome, which resulted in slaughter and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Indeed, it was not until 1948 that there was once more a distinctively Jewish entity in the land of Israel. Jesus is talking about, is predicting, the end of an era, the end of an aeon, or eon as we would say. The world is indeed coming to an end, but not the world as a physical creation, but the world as a political arrangement. The world, in the sense that Jesus describes the prince of this world. Notice that Jesus talks here about betrayal within the community. The intense emotions stirred up by such events cause people to turn against their nearest and dearest. One of the most militant factions of Jesus' time were the Iscari, who pursued an armed rebellion against Rome. That's probably why Judas the Iscariot betrayed Jesus, as Jesus wasn't going to provide the sort of rejection of Rome that Judas wanted. The kingdom of God, as we touched on last week, is deeply politically engaged, but it is not rivalrous. It is never the case that the kingdom corresponds exactly to any particular form of human polity. We might say that there is a diversity and plurality within the kingdom that reflects the diversity and plurality of humanity as created in the image of God, which means that it is always a mistake to identify any political arrangement as being of God, as divinely sanctioned to the exclusion of all others. Where there is charity and grace, there is the kingdom. The truth is that all of our political arrangements have a shelf life. They're born, they grow, they mature and they die. The particular arrangements that have held for many centuries now, of Western secular dominance, this era is coming to an end. We're not to be afraid of this. After all, the church has lived through such convulsions many times before, and it is able to live through them because at root, and sometimes this has been forgotten by the church, at root we know that the kingdom of God is not to be identified with any particular political arrangement. Rather, what we are to do, always, is recognise that nothing lasts forever, nothing outside of us, but also we ourselves. What Jesus encourages his disciples to do is to live in the light of eternity, to live each moment as if it were our last. That is what lies behind several of his parables, the talk about the sudden arrival of a travelling master, or the bridegroom that arrives at night to find some virgins that were wise and some that were foolish. The point is not to try and work out the right time to be prepared for, the point is to be prepared all the time. In other words, to not get distracted and caught up with the ways of the world, thinking of them as being more important than they eventually are. Rather, to consider ourselves always as standing before God, ready to give an account of the hope which is in us. Jesus says, The one who endures to the end shall be saved. If we are able to hold ourselves back from being captured by the world, to live and act in the world, but not to become of the world, then we shall be living in the kingdom. Then, in the midst of our trials and tribulations, perhaps we can hear Jesus' message, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. There's a prayer in Compline, the night service, that I'm fond of, and if we can take the word in it, night, symbolically, I feel it's an appropriate prayer for this present hour.
be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the silent hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world may rest upon your eternal changelessness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>